Hi kids, so I will be discussing to you the introduction to electrolytes. So this will be our first topic for midterms and lesson 5 for the whole clinical chemistry 2 uh, laboratory. So for our objectives, uh, we will be discussing first uh, the importance of water and its physiologic mechanism and then describe the behavior of your solutes for you to better understand what electrolytes are and then by then, we will be talking about specific electrolytes in which uh, the following parameters will be followed. So just like your enzymes, we will be focusing more on the sample consideration, the determination or methods, and your reference range. But of course, we'll give a brief uh, general property, just a very short uh, about your specific electrolytes and then uh, for this time also, we will I will also include discussing your package inserts. So basically, this will be our content, our table of contents. So we'll discuss about the introduction, then we'll, we'll proceed with your sodium and potassium, then lastly regarding your fully automated machine, which is your Pentra C200. But of course, uh, what I did is that I will be breaking this down into three different videos. So expect that there will be three different links that will be sent to you. Kasi syempre, uh, I don't want to overwhelm you just by uh, looking at the time in terms of how much, uh, how long this discussion will be. So we'll break this into three. So for this video, we'll just be focusing on your introduction. So for the introduction to electrolytes, so let me just give a brief description about what electrolytes are. So of course, from the name itself, from the word electro, meaning to say that these are electrically charged elements or compounds in which they carry a specific charge, whether they are positively charged or negatively charged. Now, electrolytes are based on migra migration on your electrical fields in which the most common uh, method being used could either be your electrophoresis or your potentiometry basically electrophoresis can also be used since your electrophoresis uh, co are composed of either a positive or a negative electrode now as mentioned your electrolytes carry different charges be it a positive charge or a negative or a negative charge so for those electrolytes which carry a positive charge we call it your cation whereas your negatively charged electrolytes are what we call your anion so looking at your electrophoresis here your image uh, your electrophoresis places two different electrodes one is a positive electrode which we call your anode and the other one is your neg negative electrode, which we call your cathode. So, please be careful with the terms, kids, huh? because as you can see, uh, an ion and then my anode, a uh, cation and then my cathode. So, same sila in terms of the first few uh, letters sa beginning sa name. Then again, if we're talking about electrodes, yung my ODE is the last. When we're talking about your electrolytes, yung ION ang last. So just remember the principle that opposite attracts. So meaning to say your cations being a positively charged, being positively charged would go to your cathode being a negative electrode. Whereas your anions being a negatively charged compound or element will go to your positive electrode which is your anode now these are the different electrolytes that will be discussed to you one by one uh, there are a lot of electrolytes in the body kids but what we will be discussing are those which are clinically significant so starting from your sodium then your potassium then we have your calcium and chloride then magnesium then lactate then phosphate and lastly your bicarbonate so of course here in the laboratory again we will just be focusing on the laboratory side and actually some of these uh, electrolytes have a very short discussion in a sense that there are only a few methods that will be discussed so that is why uh, looking at the excel excel image that i have sent but there are electrolytes that will be discussed uh sabay sabay then again do not be overwhelmed because you know there are some of these electrolytes na isa lang ang method basta yun, very short lang na mga discussion now 
Electrolytes kids can be classified or can be grouped according to the charges that they carry. So in terms of the negatively charged electrodes, we have your bicarbonate, your chloride, your phosphorus. Kindly include here your lactate. And then here for your positively charged uh, electrolytes, we have your calcium, your magnesium, your potassium, and then your sodium. So other than grouping your electrolytes in terms of the uh, electric charges that they carry, we can al actually also group them in terms of the functions. Now, very general ang function ng electrolytes, and there are electrolytes na hindi lang ito yung, nag yung may ganitong function, so that is why, as what I have mentioned, we can group them according to function. So, in terms of the volume and osmotic regulation, we have your sodium chloride and your potassium. In terms of your myocardial rhythm and contractility, we have your potassium, magnesium, and calcium. In terms of being a cofactor kids, in which I know this time around you can already relate to this since we are done with your enzymes and in terms of enzymes, there are enzymes that needs cofactors. So examples of those are your magnesium, your calcium, and your zinc. And being a cofactor, diba, take note na yung specific name natin sa mga cofactors na mga ions or what we call your activators. Then you have here regulation of ATPase ion pump including the production and use of your ATP from glucose involved si magnesium. Then in the production and use of ATP from glucose, we will add phosphate here. Now for the acid-base balance, I know you also are familiar with this since acid-base balance uh, na discuss siya during your clinical chemistry one in which namo mga computation nagibuhat and there are a lot of uh, normal ranges that is being memorized for us to be able to give a conclusion as to what is the problem of our patient hindi ba na ay pinakadako na role dira is ang inyuhang bicarbonate but other than bicarbonate your potassium and chloride can also be included next we have your blood coagulation Actually, in terms of coagulation, kids, uh, you would get to appreciate more of this during your hematology. I guess hematology too, pa siguro, uh, in terms of the specific topic about your thrombocytes or your platelets. Kasi diba sila yung may role in terms of coagulation. And what is involved here in blood coagulation are your calcium and your magnesium, especially your calcium kids. And then for your neuromuscular excitability, you have your potassium, your calcium, and your magnesium. So these are the general functions of your electrolytes. And of course, along the way, especially during your lecture, lecture uh, these functions will be emphasized and will be discussed more deeper. So again, in the, here in the laboratory, so yung general lang yung i-represent namin. Now, to know better your electrolytes, we need to talk first we need to discuss first about your dihydrogen monoxide. And as you all know, when we talk about dihydrogen monoxide, that means commonly known as your water. Now, water, uh, the general or basic description of water is, diba? Memorize kayo nato ni siya. When we say water, it is the universal solvent. And being a universal solvent, kids, water also has a very big role in terms of uh in terms of the bodily processes that we have, na very important na agute water sa body. Now, our total body water volume, kids, is about 40 liters or around 60% of our body weight. Now, there are two different compartments where water can be seen. One is here in your intracellular and the other one is in your extracellular. So, when we say intra, meaning inside, inside your cells. When we say extracellular, meaning outside your cells. Now, intracellular fluid kids is about 25 liters or about 40% of our body weight, while your extracellular fluid volume is around 15 liters or 20% of our body weight. Now, this extracellular fluid kids can be divided pa into two, as seen here in this uh, image. So, extracellular fluid may dalawa pa. We have this interstitial fluid and your plasma volume. Now, plasma volume, kids, is also known as your intravascular. Intravascular. So, from the word vascular, meaning to say we are looking at uh, your blood vessels here. Na kumbaga, uh, of course, as we all know, 
when we say blood vessels, di lamang yun na siya purely plasma, but somehow intravascular can be synonymous with plasma because majority of our blood is composed of your plasma. So going back to interstitial fluids muna, when we say interstitial fluid kids, this is the fluid, uh, these are the fluid found uh, in the spaces around your cells. Whereas again, for your plasma volume, dun sa blood vessels nyo. And as you can see, interstitial fluid is composed of around 12 liters. And your plasma volume is around 3 liters. So 80% of your ECF is from your interstitial fluid, while only 20% is coming from your intravascular. So to further emphasize regarding your plasma kits, kasi diba, I, what I, as I have mentioned, looking at your whole blood, uh, if you try to look at its component more on or majority of it is your plasma so from a whole blood the sample once it is centrifuged diba, it can be divided into three parts you have your plasma you have your buffy coat diba, kanina portion this is your buffy coat and then lastly you have your formed elements or basically your erythrocytes so as you can see, plasma is about 55%. Buffy coat, naaral gani siguro na siya sa uh, mga 10% or less. And then the rest is already your erythrocytes. So tanawa kids, plasma is mas daghan. So that is why as what I have mentioned, kaya sometimes nagiging synonymous yung words na intravascular and plasma because uh, more on majority is made up of plasma. And looking at your plasma kids, 91% of that is your water. So, ganun yung rationale behind. So, here in this image, what I would like to emphasize is in terms of the difference of the blood volume, uh, rather than blood volume, the difference of our water, water volume, would greatly depend in terms of gender. As you can see sa mga babae, about 55% lang. Sa mga laki, that is about 60%. Now, uh, in terms of gender kids, uh, looking at the percentage of water uh, in terms of gender, diba men requires more water than women. Now, the reason behind this, pwede nato siya summarize into three. So, number one, because men have uh, a higher energy expenditure. Again, men have higher energy expenditure. Second, less body fat ang males compared to females. And lastly, males have greater na muscle mass. Again, three things. One, higher energy expenditure. Second, less body fat. And lastly, greater muscle mass. That is the reason why uh, males have higher uh, water requirement than females. And here in this illustration, kids, as you can see here in this portion, Diba? Uh, na emphasize again in terms of the different compartments of water. So for your ICF, that is about two thirds, while your ECF is about one third. Actually, in this image, in this portion, itong naka box, mas ma emphasize po yung difference between your interstitial fluid and your intravascular or your plasma. So again, by definition, interstitial fluid is the fluid seen. As the spaces between your cells. So that is why, uh, as uh, pointed here, ito, fluid spaces outside and be in between your cells. Whereas your plasma, as seen here, naka point talaga siya sa blood vessels nyo. So for this portion, kids, I would just like to emphasize that, of course, when talking about water, it is not just composed of electrolytes, but meron din tayo mga non electrolytes. So, these are your non-electrolytes na uh, concentration and ano-ano po yun sila. And then, for this portion, kids, uh, in terms of electrolytes, other than grouping them by the electric charges, by function, we can actually also group it according, according to which they are majority, may, uh, majority where majority of them can be found. So, it's either they are intracellular, or they are extracellular. 
Sige lang kids, uh, for this portion, you don't have to remember this one, especially the non-electrolytes. Again, I would just like to present this one for you to have a better idea in terms of the composition. In terms of sino yung mga intracellular, sino yung mga electrolytes na extracellular. So you will get to know that uh, along the way na matapos namin or madiscuss namin pa isa-isa yung mga different electrolytes nyo. So, at least you already have an idea as to how to group your electrolytes. Again, number one, sa electric charges. Second, sa function. And lastly, in terms of saan po sila makikita. Or saan yung majority ng mga electrolytes nyo uh, makikita. So, here, this is just another representation, kids, in terms of the concentration of your electrolytes. And I would like to emphasize that your electrolytes is not just found at a certain compartment. It's just that my majority majority of it can be found at 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 a certain part. So for example, si sodium, di ba? Sodium can be found both in your extra and intra, but it's just that majority of it is here in your extracellular fluid. So kaya makikita nyo dito sa graph na uh, it is presented kids it is presented here in your graph as to the concentration of whichever compartment we are talking about. Yung three major compo uh, compartments nyo. Your ICF, your ECF, and then divided into two, so your interstitial and your plasma. So again, for now, you do not need to memorize this one. Along the way, uh, madiscuss man po na to ang reference range sa inyo ang mga electrolytes. So hinahinayon lang po na to siya. One at a time lang po na. So, now you might wonder na, ma'am, unsa mang yun ang purpose? Why are we talking about water? What is the relationship of water sa, ating, sa mga electrolytes? Now, kids, your water distribution is greatly controlled by your electrolytes and your proteins. Diba? Your water is greatly affected by the number of electrolytes or the concentration of your electrolytes and including your proteins. Now, to best explain the relationship, Remember this one, diba? you have this what we call the movement of your water which would greatly depend on the solute that is present in our body or in a solution. Now, syempre here, this is an example of your osmosis. Now, whenever we talk about osmosis, diba? that means the movement of your water from a low to a high concentration. Or if we're looking at your solute, solutes, it is the movement of your solutes from a higher to a lower concentration. But since we are trying to focus on water as to why it is controlled by your solutes, so ganito lang kids, di ba? Uh, remember that in our body, we have this what we call your semi-permeable membranes. Now, when we say semi-permeable membranes, it means that any ions can pass through and not all, most of your ions can pass through but for some, uh, naalam po tayong mga certain conditions for it. Now, of course, in a membrane, water can freely go in and out of your cell. That is why, if naatay duha compartment here as seen in this image, diba, tanan, tanan, salt solution ninyo uh, nasa, nasa isang side lang, so, what happens is that for both compartments to be in equilibrium, to be in a homeostasis, homeostasis state, na kumbaga dapat in equal, in equal na ka ng, in equal portions siya, water will go inside para again to balance out both the compartments that is present. So, that is why kung asa yun ang nai-increase the concentration sa inyuhang uh, solute kids, be it your electrolytes or proteins, water will always follow. So, that is why naatay kaning ginatawag na where salt is, water follows. Because then again, what we are trying to achieve here is a balance. So, kaya, you need to under we need to understand the relationship of your water and the solutes. So, the concentration of your ions, kids, whether we are looking at your intracellular and extracellular, they are maintained by your different transport mechanisms. So, going back to your transport mechanisms, uh, diba, I think this is discussed during your biochemistry or even during your high school days. Uh, I think na mga na discuss man siguro ni, diba na atay ginatawag na active transport and your passive transport in which under your passive transport see diffusion now 
what is the main difference between the two? Diba? Um, saman, maalala pa. Diba? When we say active and passive, the main difference here, kids, is the requirement of energy. Because between the two, what requires energy is your active, while your passive, does, passive uh, transport does not need any energy. And in terms of the requirement of energy, the very basis there is in terms of its movement. Kasi with passi passive transport, there is uh, no energy needed because it just goes with the flow. Whereas your active transport, since it is going against the flow, that is why it requires energy. So, uh, usually yung aking pini-picture out dito so that I won't get confused is in terms of going up and down the stairs. Diba? What requires more energy is in terms of going up the stairs, whereas it requires lesser to no energy when you're going down. So, if it relate na to na siya sa inyong transport mechanisms, for active transport, going from a low to a higher na concentration, going against the flow mga good, so that is why it requires energy, whereas your passive transport, transport from a high to low, Manggood na siya. Sumuha na na it does not require any energy. Sumuha na siya. So here, an example of your active transport is your ATP's dependent sodium potassium ion pumps. And for your diffusion, kids, it is a passive movement of your ions across a membrane which would greatly depend on size and the charge of ion and can be altered by your physiologic and hormonal processes. Now, if you could still recall, there are actually two types of uh, passive transport. You have your simple and your facilitated diffusion. So, for that portion, you can actually look at it in this image. So, again, these are your transport pathways. There are the active, there are the passive, in which it is divided into two. Now, we facilitated and now we simple. Actually, na ako different na image na add here, kids, just to emphasize more on the energy kasi sa previous na image diba nakasulat energy lang but wala kayong makita na any molecule kasi number one mang good in terms of the requirement of energy is really the attachment of it in your uh, carrier proteins so ito po yung active transport nyo this one yung my ATP and this is your passive transport number three is your diffusion and number four is your facilitated now, actually, na ako ay present na video sa inyo ha, kids, just so you would understand more as to the difference between the two. Now, I know you already know about this, especially it, uh, because it has been already discussed to you. But just for you, para uh, for the benefit of everyone, especially to those students na basig nakalimot na good, so might as well uh, present this video na lang. So, kindly watch this video. Have you ever wondered what it might be like to be inside a cell? Imagine the genetic material, the cytoplasm, the ribosomes. You'll find those in almost all cells, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Eukaryote cells, in addition, have membrane-bound organelles. All of those structures and organelles have different functions, but cells are not isolated little worlds. They do have a lot going on inside them, but they also need to interact with their environment. It makes sense that to keep a stable environment inside themselves, otherwise known as keeping homeostasis, they must have some control on what goes in and what goes out of them. A very important structure for this that all cells contain is the cell membrane. By controlling what goes in and out, the cell membrane helps regulate homeostasis. It's the homeostasis king. Let's take a look at the cell membrane. You could have a whole course on the cell membrane itself. It has amazing structure. It has signaling abilities. But to stick to the very basics, it's made of a phospholipid bilayer. Bilayer means two layers, so you have these two layers of lipids. Now, these lipids, they're called phospholipids, well, they have a head that is polar, and they have a tail that is nonpolar, making them quite unique. 
some molecules, they have no problem going through the cell membrane, and they directly go through the phospholipid bilayer. Very small, nonpolar molecules, they fit in this category. They're a great example. Like some gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide gas, those are great examples. This is known as simple diffusion. Also, it doesn't take any energy to force those molecules in or out, so it's known as passive transport. Simple diffusion moves with the flow, meaning it moves with the concentration gradient. Molecules move from high concentration to low concentration. So when you hear someone saying that something's going with the concentration gradient, that's what they mean. They mean it's going from a high concentration of molecules to a low concentration of molecules. Now, remember how we said the cell membrane is actually a pretty complex structure? Well, one thing we haven't mentioned yet are proteins in the membrane, and some of them are transport proteins. Some transport proteins act as channels. Some of these proteins actually change their shape to get things across. Some of them open and closed based on some kind of stimulus. All of these are good things because it's helping with molecules that may be too big to cross the membrane on their own or molecules that are polar and therefore need the help of a transport protein. This is known as facilitated diffusion. It's still diffusion, and it still moves with the concentration gradient of high to low. It doesn't require energy, though, so it's also a type of passive transport. It's just the proteins are facilitating or helping things pass. Charged ions often require a protein channel in order to pass through. Glucose needs the help of a transport protein to pass through. In osmosis, for water to travel at a fast rate across the membrane, it passes through protein channels called aquaporins. So these are all examples of facilitated diffusion, which is a type of passive transport and moves with the concentration gradient of high to low concentration. Now all the transport we've mentioned has been passive in nature. That means it's going from high concentration to low concentration. But what if you want to go the other way? For example, the cells lining your gut, they need to take in glucose. But what if the concentration of glucose in the cell is higher than the amount of glucose concentration in the environment? We would still need to get the glucose in, so it's going to have to be forced against the regular gradient flow. Movement of molecules from low to high concentration will take energy because that's against the flow. Typically, it's going to require ATP energy. A reminder that ATP, adenosine triphosphate, it has three phosphates. And when the bond for the last phosphate is broken, it releases a great amount of energy. Yeah, so ATP is a pretty awesome little molecule. ATP can power active transport to force molecules to go against their concentration gradient. And one way it can do that is actually energizing the transport protein itself. One of our favorite examples of active transport is the sodium-potassium pump. So that's definitely something worth checking out. There's other times a cell needs to exert energy for transport. We're still in active transport right now, but let's say a cell needs a very large molecule. Let's say a big polysaccharide. If you check out our biomolecule video, that's a large carbohydrate. Well, you may need the cell to fuse with the molecules it's taking in in order to bring it inside. And this is called endocytosis. Think endo for in. Often this fusing of substances within the cell membrane will form vesicles that can be taken inside the cell. Endocytosis is kind of a general term. There are different types of endocytosis depending on how that cell is bringing substances inside. Amoebas, for example, rely on a form of endocytosis. In this example, pseudopods stretch out around what they are going to engulf, and then it pulls it into a vacuole. And there are other forms, too, such as the fancy receptor-mediated endocytosis. This is where cells can be very, very, very picky on what's coming in because the incoming substances actually have to bind to receptors to even get in. Or penocytosis, this allows cells to take in fluids. So to the Google to find out more details of the different types of endocytosis. 
exocytosis is the reverse direction of endocytosis. Think exo and exit. They sound very similar, too. Exocytosis can be used to get rid of cell waste, but it's also really important for getting valuable materials out that the cell has made. Want a cool example? Well, think back to those polysaccharides. Did you know that large carbohydrates are also really important for making plant cell walls? Cell walls are different from cell membranes. I mean, all cells have membranes, but not all cells have a wall, but plant cells do. And if you're going to make a cell wall, you're going to need to get those carbohydrates that are produced in the plant cell out of the cell to make the wall. So there's a great example of when you'd need exocytosis right there. Well, that's it for the Amoeba Sisters, and we remind you to stay curious. Yun kids, so I know that there were uh, some parts of the video, especially the endocytosis, exocytosis, na not really uh, very much significant in terms of our discussion. But then again, uh, na lang yun siyang gihuman, okay? it might be that there are some of you who are interested, then at least it's a good to know mampud na mga na discussion. So yun kids, that is what your passive and active uh, is or are and the difference between your simple and your facilitated diffusion. So now let's move on to osmolality. Diba? Unsang importance karon sa osmolality. Now I know you are familiar with this term, this uh, with these terms, your osmolality and osmolarity na going back to your uh, laboratory mathematics. Diba? Isa, isa, isa niya sa inyong gina-compute. Remember your W over W and your W over V. Now, in terms of osmolality, uh, these are your concentration of solutes per kilogram of solvent. Whereas for osmolarity, that is in terms of the weight of your solute over the volume of it. So between osmolality and osmolarity, uh, better to use osmolality kids, especially in these cases. Since osmolarity may be inaccurate, if your patient has hyperlipidemia or hyperproteinemia, for urine specimens, and if there are presence of osmo uh, osmotically active substances like your alcohol or mannitol. Although, if you try to read uh, Bishop, wala kaayo na, na niyagi explain as to the reason why it can be inaccurate. But one thing we could actually look at, it's because of the difference. Difference sa uh, property that we are trying to check. Kasi diba, better mang yun kung same na weight same na volume rather than weight and volume ang tinitingnan. So, again, that is the reason na ako ang makita in terms of why it could be inaccurate in these cases. Then again, kids, whether we use the word osmolality or osmolarity, always take note that this is synonymous to your solute concentration. So, to explain further, uh, osmolarity kids is very important in terms of the distribution of your water now uh, now your osmolarity if there is uh, a high or low levels of osmolarity that would greatly affect the movement of your water so look at this schematic diagram in terms of there is high or if there is a decrease in your plasma osmolarity. Now again, think of osmolarity as your number of solute concentration. So when we say high plasma osmolarity, case, this is equivalent to saying there is an increase in your solute concentration. And always, if there is a, an increase in your solute concentration, kids, it will always be opposite in, the, in your water concentration. So, kung increase kay ang solute, you would expect na syempre mag-lower down yun ang inyuhang water. Kasi sobra-sobra sa solute. Whereas, when we say there is low plasma osmolarity, there is a decrease in your solute concentration. And thus, ang nagsobra-sobra po dito is in terms of your water volume. Now, this thirst mechanism, kids, and your antidiuretic hormone, these are just some of the 
hormones and mechanisms that will that will be activated if there is changes in your blood volume if there are changes in your osmolarity so as you can see here in your if there is high plasma osmolarity but that would mean there is a decrease in your water concentration so what happens now is that our body will give a signal to your hypothalamus saying that it's time to activate your thirst mechanism so literal ning thirst mechanism kids na tipong uhawon mo and then what happens next is, uh, next is that of course you will ingest water another thing that will happen is that your antidiuretic hormone will also be activated and the action of your antidiuretic hormone kids is water adaraday the action of your antidiuretic hormone kids is water reabsorption so diba mga correlate na ba na yun na nga kung taas ang plasma osmolarity baba ang water thus na a thirst and adh na increase water will be ingested water will be reabsorbed thus water will be retained and your plasma osmolarity will normalize in a sense na ginabalik kung increase ang inyong water until such time that it will normalize so on the ano uh, on the other hand when there is low plasma osmolarity remember sobra sobra si water sa body so what happens here is that thirst will be decreased your antidiuretic hormone will also be decreased Meaning to say, walay water reabsorption, walay ingestion, ingestion kay water. So, water will be lost. Meaning to say, kaning ka-increase sa water nato sa body kids, it will be removed. And how will it be removed? Through your kidneys in the form of your urine. And thus, your plasma osmolarity now will normalize. Now, take note lang din, kids, that your antidiuretic hormone is also known as your AVP. This is actually its former name, which means your arginine vasopressin. So, again, it is just the former name of your antidiuretic hormone. Kasi, kids, uh, di, sa mga next na PowerPoint mang good na ako, wala kayo na ako na consistent mag gamit na puro ADH lang. There are times that I will use AVP, so please do not be confused. Again, they are just the same. So, for the clinical significance of your osmolality, syempre, na-appreciate naman siguro yun ang clinical significance no, na again, any changes in our osmolality concentration would greatly affect the distribution of water. So, normal plasma osmolality is actually around 275 to 295 milliosmoles per kilogram. And osmoreceptors kid respond to very small changes. Now, kaning mga receptors, of course, in our body kids, there are a lot of receptors. Uh, sometimes, it can be specific to a certain hormone. Basta kids, when we say receptor, sila ni ang nag -check. Sila ni ang nag-respond as to the different changes in our body. Sila ni ang nag signal sa ato ang brain. Na yun na nga, kailangan na ba ni siya i-release? Kailangan na ba ni siya i-suppress? Ang kanina, certain substance or hormone. So, literal, sa inyong osmoreceptors, literal, na kanin sa name pa lang, you will already get an idea kung sa ang iyahang role. So, the role of your osmoreceptors is in terms of the changes in your osmolality. So, Kaning osmoreceptors respond to small changes. What we are referring here to small changes is the 1 to 2% na change lang sa atong osmolarity. Na agad-agad, it will react, it will either release or suppress your, uh, your uh, the necessary hormones to normalize your osmolality. So, included na po. Included na po dun uh, si ADH and even yung thirst mechanism. And uh, stated, as explained also a while ago, osmolality is regulated by your ADH and your thirst. Now for this portion kids, actually na-explain naman ako ni siya, this is actually already related sa katong high uglo ninyo na osmolality. When we say there is water loading, 
meaning to say there is increase in your water concentration. So what happens now is that there is low plasma osmolarity. Again, osmolality equivalent to saying there is low solute. So what happens now, kasi sobra-sobra po yung water, ito na, your AVP and your thirst mechanism will be suppressed. There is no reabsorption of water, thus you would expect that your urine is diluted. Why? Kasi nga, wala re walang reabsorption, kids. So, meaning to say, yung water nyo, i-release, iihi. So, diluted yung urine. Now, hypoosmolality and hyponatremia uh, rarely happens, kids, but this is usually observed if there is impaired renal excretion of your water. Next, for your water deficit. So, when we say water deficit, meaning... Uh, meaning baba ang inyuhang water. So, in short, taas ang in plasma osmolality or taas ang solute na concentration. So, since here there is less water present in our body, your AVP and thirst mechanism will be activated. There is reabsorption, thus you would expect that your urine here now is concentrated. Kasi nga, walay urine na gina ah, walay water na gina-release, ginabalik siya sa atong body, so lesser water content in the urine, thus it's more on solute, so concentrated. Now, during cases where there is less water kids, hypernatremia can happen, but then again, as stated here, it rarely occurs because as long as you have a normal thirst mechanism and you have access to water, then walay problema in terms of your sodium concentration. Hypernatremia you, is usually observed to those patients na infant or unconscious or those unable to either drink or ask for water. So that already explains the reason why it is common to infants and unconscious patients. Siyempre, mga infant kids, hindi pa nakaka- <coughs> Excuse me, di pa po marunong magsalita. So, meaning to say, they cannot directly tell their parents na they need water na. Kaya dapat, dako ug role si parents diri na from time to time, they really need to check the water in intake of their chill of their uh, babies. And of course, for the unconscious patient, siyempre unconscious na nga. For example, basig in coma si patient. So, yun nga, tayo talaga, nurses... Should nurses or the direct family na nagabantay should really observe their water intake para dilipun sila magabot ani na time and there will be no further complications. So, other than your ADH and your thirst mechanism, kids, actually there are a lot, diba na mention na ako kaganina na the ADH and thirst mechanism is just a few of those hormones involved in terms of regulating your blood volume. So, the best system to explain the regulation of your blood volume, kids, is what we call your renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Now, take a look at this portion first. Uh, the very first thing that you need to remember is that uh, the reason why your renin is being stimulated. Renin, kids, is, ve is a very important enzyme that is actually an enzyme which in which will control your, uh, will control your, uh, what you call this, your blood volume, especially if in cases na may decrease na blood volume, may decrease na blood pressure, may decrease na sodium delivery, and may increase na sympathetic tone. Uh, looking at sympathetic tone, kids, that is relating to your cardiovascular. So, bali, if there are, if mauni siya, na mga fa, na, uh, if mauni siya ang case, kids, then renin will be stimulated or will be released. And take note that renin actually comes from your kidney. Now, na-mention ako kaganina, enzyme si renin. So, you might ask na, ma'am, di ba, tanan enzyme, it ends with ASE. Renin, kids, is actually also named, known as your angio tensinogenase. So, looking at its former name, and dun yung ending na ASE, and actually from its former name also, kids, you will already get an idea as to an, uh, unsa, ang iya, unsa na substance iyahang ginakatalay sa reaction. So, dirita magtanawa na sa inyuhang angiotensinogen. Now, angiotensinogen 
carcinogen kids comes from your liver in which upon the reaction of upon the action of your renin your angiotensin will be converted to angiotensin 1 angiotensin 1 will be converted into ang angiotensin 2 with the presence of your ACE that is your angiotensin converting enzyme again ACE means angiotensin converting enzyme now angiotensin 2 kids dako kaayo ni siya og role siya ni ang mag take place aning tanan na makita ninyo sa lower portion but let me emphasize first hand its direct action so again angiotensin 2 has indirect and direct action when we say direct action kids ito po siya na portion your angiotensin 2 has a direct effect in your vascular smooth muscles. It will cause vasoconstriction, thus causing hypertension. So again, it is involved in terms of your vasoconstriction. So what happens now here is hypertension will happen, correcting the decrease in your blood pressure. Now since there is vasoconstriction, your kidneys will also be affected in a sense that it will constrict your glomerular efferent arteriole. Again, your arterioles are composed of smooth muscles, so that is why it is also affected. Now, constricting this efferent, efferent arteriole will cause an increase in your sodium hydrogen exchanger activity. So again, the direct action of your angiotensin 2 is in terms of vasoconstriction. So what are the indirect now? When we say indirect, Shani ang tigtawag. It will be it. Uh, your angiotensin 2 is responsible in stimulating all other hormones necessary for blood volume regulation. First is your antidiuretic hormone, which comes from your posterior pituitary. Next is your thirst mechanism, in which your hypothalamus is in control. And lastly, your aldosterone hormone, kids coming from your adrenal cortex and the main role of your uh, main role of your aldosterone is in terms of your sodium reabsorption so again these are all the indirect effects of your angiotensin 2 calling other hormones necessary for blood volume regulation thirst mechanism adh aldosterone so yun yung whole renin angiotensin aldosterone system kids now, the next thing that you need to understand is, what if po ma'am, kaya diba si renin man kaya ma-stimulate if there is a decrease in the blood volume, there is a decrease in blood pressure. Now, how about if there is an increase? Sino yung may role in terms of lowering blood pressure and blood volume? So, try to look at this schematic diagram pa rin kids. So, what is emphasized here is your ANP. ANP stands for your atrial natriuretic peptide. Now, in cases where there is increased blood volume, blood pressure, Ang mag-take into action, anak kids, is your anti -nat atrial natriuretic peptide. In which the action of your atrial natriuretic peptide is in terms of your vasodilation and the excretion of your sodium and water. Thus, correcting this one, lowering your blood pressure and blood volume, normalize until such time na mag-normalize na ang iyahang amount. So again, ANP is opposite in terms of your angiotensin 2. Kung si angiotensin 2 is to increase blood volume and blood pressure, ANP is for decreasing blood volume and blood pressure. So, yun yun siya. So, kindly take note of that. So, eto kids, this is already the summary. Summary of all those we have mentioned that have a control in the regulation of your uh, of your blood volume. Diba? Na-mention na to si thirst mechanism, si angiotensin 2, si aldosterone, even inyuhang ANP, and your ADH. And then, andito na rin po nakasulat uh, ano yung mechanism and ano yung effect nila. 
this one is just another representation in terms of your renin angiotensin aldosterone system okay so kindly read this one so now let's proceed in terms of looking into your urine osmolality so syempre kaganina plasma osmolality man to karon is urine now urine osmolality vary widely depending on your water intake and the collection circumstances so urine osmolality is decreased in cases where there is diabetes insipidus or polydipsia and it is increased if na siadh or hypovolemia so we all know what polydipsia means meaning there is increased thirst hypovolemia there is decreased blood volume so let us try to look at diabetes insipidus and SIADH kids and try to relate it to its concentration or in terms of your urine osmolality. So dilita sa next slide para natin mas dako na space sa pag-explain. So again, sa diabetes insipidus, di ba diabetes insipidus kay decrease? Decrease urine, osmolali, uh, urine osmolality. So UO na to na. Uh, this one, the I is increase, increase urine osmolality. So, unsa day ang main na problem between these two? Kids, this is related to antidiuretic hormone. Now, when we say diabetes insipidus, there is decrease antidiuretic hormone, whereas for your SIADH, there is an increase in your antidiuretic hormone. Now, SI here means syndrome. of inappropriate kids syndrome of inappropriate and then adh as usual antidiuretic hormone so again this is syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone now going back to the action of your antidiuretic hormone remember that this is related to water reabsorption so if baba your inyuhang adh meaning baba ang water reabsorption Whereas, kung taas ang antidiuretic hormone, then sobra-sobra ang water reabsorption. Now, what will be the effect here in your urine? Kids, duha ang atong tanawon. Plasma, urine. So, lahat nato dali, plasma o urine. Now, kung baba si antidiuretic hormone, di ba walay water reabsorption? Meaning to say, ang water ninyo from your plasma to your urine, sige-sige lang ug uh, ihi. Sige-sige lang ug release. Thus, there will be an increase in your urine osmolality. Okay? Since diri mag-increase ang water tungod kay ginaihi man tanan, so magbaba ang inyuhang solute na concentration. Whereas here, sa inyuhang SID, SIADH, since diba increase ang ADH, increase ang water reabsorption, so instead of releasing urine, it will go back to your plasma. So, you would expect here na baba ang inyuhang water concentration and ang taas ang inyuhang solute sa ihi mismo. So, kaya ang urine osmolality here is increased. So, I hope na picture out kids na kuha. So, again, urine osmolality, always pag osmolality, look at the solute concentration. So, here, Again, going back for diabetes insipidus, sobra-sobra ang water, kay walay reabsorption, meaning ang kanang pagbalik na to sa body is wala. Puro siya ginaihi, thus nagbaba ang solute concentration. So here you would expect that your urine is diluted. Here for SIADH, since sobra-sobra sa ADH, sige og reabsorb, meaning to say ginabalik sa atong plasma, so, baba ang water, sobra-sobra ang solute. So, that is the reason behind why it is under the decrease and the increase. So, yun po siya. So, for the determination of your osmolality, kids, uh, syempre, if you need to use urine or, se or your serum. Now, why dili recommended ang paggamit sa inyong plasma? Because kids, remember that when, whenever we need a plasma sample, it entails the use of anticoagulants. And anticoagulants have their own na kanang mga substances pa. Thus, may introduce uh, mga other osmotically active substances that can be present. So that is why Dili Gyud recommend ang paggamit o plasma because of 
the use of anticoagulants. Now, when measuring osmolality, what is commonly measured are your sodium chloride and bicarbonate, which are major electrolytes with increased concentration yield. Now, your osmolality is based on your colligative properties. Diba, I guess during your instrumentation lecture sa FinChem 1, na explain many sa osmolality. And there are a lot of colligative properties that we can look at. But the most common one that is being used for the measurement of osmolality is kanin yung freezing point depression. Diba, napuntay ka tong vapor pressure. Now, turbid specimen must be centrifuged to remove any extraneous particle. So, when measuring osmolality kids, syempre, th that can be done in a fully automated machine which we call your osmometers. So, these are examples of your osmometers. Kaning gray one, kaning gray one na nasa inyo hang left side portion, karaan na siya na styles osmometer. This one na, ang current na ka na mga osmometers that you can find na mga modern ones. Now, since we're talking about freezing point depression, kids, nalang po ko'y short video na ipakita for you to understand uh, what, how, or what is the mechanism behind freezing point depression. So, kindly watch this video. Let's take a closer look at what happens inside the osmometer when a freezing point measurement is made. Once a sample is introduced in the cooling chamber, it is rapidly supercooled to a predetermined temperature below the expected sample freezing point. This rate of cooling is tightly controlled by the osmometer. While the sample is in the supercooled state, a physical shock called the freeze pulse is introduced to the sample. As a result, the sample becomes partially crystallized, forming an ice water mixture surrounding the temperature probe. The heat of fusion resulting from the crystallization process raises the sample temperature to a plateau where the liquid-solid equilibrium is maintained. This temperature plateau represents the true freezing point of the solution. The osmometer precisely measures this temperature at the plateau and calculates the concentration in milliosmoles per kilogram of water. This is the test result reported by the osmometer. Alright, that's it kids. Very short lang, di ba? But uh, the way I understand it in terms of your freezing point depression, kids, uh, just remember lang na, di ba, uh, as simple as looking at your ice cubes, di ba, naman na siya ng heat na gina-release. So actually, I think that is what is referring to your heat fusion, na in a sense that your sample is partially crystallized and then letting it melt until and while it is melting na ay ka ng heat na gina-release in which sa makita ninyo sa video di ba na from a very low temperature mubalik siya increase until such time that it will be in a plateau or dili na siya mag further increase pa mag constant na lang ang temperature and that is what is uh, considered as the concentration or your osmolality so yun po yun okay now, if in case that there are no osmometers present or can be used, we can actually do computation for your osmolality. Now, the calculation of your osmolality can either estimate your true osmolality or your determine now the osmolal gap. So, what is this osmolal gap? Osmolal gap, kids, is the difference between your measured osmolality and your calculated osmolality. Now, it indirectly indicates the presence of osmolality uh, osmotically active substances other than your sodium, urea, and your glucose. So, ano yung mga example ng osmotically active sub substances? These are the following. It could be your ethanol, your methanol, your ethylene glycol, your lactate, or even your beta-hydroxybutyrate. Because, syempre, kids, when we talk about solutes, diba? Although major magyuna si sodium, si urea, si glucose, but then again, they are not the only solutes that can be present in the body. Thus, we need to consider other things. So, this is how you are going to compute for your serum osmolality. Sodium in minimals per liter times 2, plus your glucose in mg per dl, it divides 18, plus your urea nitro nitrogen in mg per dl, it divides sa 2.8. So, uh, wala man kaayog explain as to how this formula uh, was created or unsa ang basis. Then again, one thing that I could point out kids is kanin, number 1, 
Remember that you have this what we call your urea and your blood urea nitrogen. Na di ba natin conversion na ginagamit ana niya which is your 2.8. And then in terms of your glucose, dividing it by 18, considered a conversion factor lang siya. And then your serum sodium multiplied by 2 uh, for considering errors to ang dimension ni, ni Henry's. Actually, kay Bishop, na asya duha nag present But then again, for you not to be confused and para same-same na lang po tatanan and nalang po mo isa ka formula na i-remember. So let's memorize the one presented by Bishop. Actually kids, maghatag ang takuan niyo yung example. Yeah, I forgot to add it here sa akong slide. And uh, ang naisip na lang man po na ako is that this is just a very straightforward lang man good na formula. All you need is just to really have the values of these three. Your sodium, your glu glucose, your glucose, and your urea nitrogen. And then, very easy, before ni mo ipang add sila, just make sure that your sodium is multiplied by 2, your glucose is divided by 18, and your urea nitrogen is divided by 2.8. Ana lang. So, this is the uh, reference range for your osmolality, depending on your sample or specimen used if it is serum if it is a 24 hour urine sample kung nag urine to serum ratio ba mo or random urine lang and then you also have the concentration atong um, reference range sa inyong osmolal gap so that's it for our discussion regarding the introduction to your electrolytes so i hope nasabtan ang relationship ni water and the electrolytes so again as what i have mentioned uh, ipang separate lang na ako, ipang cut cut na ako ni mga videos for you not to be overwhelmed. And as of this moment, your introduction to electrolytes nasa around mga 1 hour. So, sakto sakto rong food. And then, short break ta. Then, proceed to watching your next video regarding your sodium and potassium na. So, thank you for listening kids. And, uh, break sa tagamay. Then, padayon sa atong next na video.